collective and the collective and joined up advocacy uh, of the network and the collective it is the the coalition whether that be on points raised around the critical importance of more longer term and sustainable commissioning and and and, and funding or through to the workforce uh, issues that we finished on. As interesting, we finished on workforce issues and we started on some more broader policy issues because I think potentially the next area that we're going to discuss in this town hall is possibly an area that's not emphasised significantly enough within the knowledge, attitude, skills frameworks of the community sport and sport for development workforce equally is it embedded strongly enough across our policy and strategy frameworks? And so to set the context for the big issue discussion, I just want to draw on the UN Framework Convention for Climate Change, Sport for Climate Action uh, framework. And it's interesting in that framework because it's aimed at supporting and guiding sport actors to help achieve global climate goals. And it says that sports impact on our climate is compl complex and can be difficult to measure, varies across organization size uh, and uh, event, but also concedes that actually sport organizations do have and can have an impact on climate change, both in terms of impacting and also potentially being a, a, a positive part of the solution. Often when previously stakeholders have been looking to engage sporting organisations around the issue of climate change, the entry point's often been the impact on sport and what the impact of some of the changes climate may have on sport. But clearly we're past that point. What we're facing is you know, devastating weather and climate change. Millions are losing their homes to rising sea levels, irreversible loss of plant uh, and animal species regions and areas becoming uninhabitable either because of uh, farm land turning into desert or vice versa, um, historic flooding caused by extreme rainfall. So this is an issue much bigger than the fact that we may lose opportunity to be involved or not uh, in, in sport. And in that context, we wanted to explore today, what can sport for development, community sport do to enhance the contribution to combating climate change. And to start our discussion, I'm really pleased to bring in Claire Poole. Some of you would know Claire from uh, driving and really being the force behind the Sports Positive Summit. Uh, also the Sport Positives Leagues, the, the ranking of different, different leagues uh, around their climate mitigation, climate uh, change measures. Now Claire's actually been involved in the sport at COP program. I'm sure we're all aware that the uh, COP26, the conference of state parties to the climate change convention taking place in Glasgow at present and absolutely critical in terms of this debate. And Claire, one thing I was interested in just to start our discussion, what's been the balance in the sport actors really engaging on this issue with uh, at COP, engaging in the UN framework, Convention on Climate Change, Climate on Sport Action uh, mm. framework between those at the elite level, those working in major leagues, mega and major events, and those working really at the grassroots level. I'll be interested in the balance there. And then with that, really from your expertise and experience, what can those actors working at a community, at a sport for development level, not working the big facilities, not working um, uh, with substantial international travel, do to really contribute to combating climate change. Claire, thanks for joining us. It'd be great to get your perspectives on that. 
Yeah, thanks, Ian, um, to Simon for inviting me to the session today. It's a pleasure to be with you all, and for those who I haven't met as well. Um, so a few things to sort of tackle there in terms of what you've teed up, Ollie. I think just so people are aware, um, in terms of our work at Sport Positive, I've been involved with the UN Sports for Climate Action Framework since its inception. We started working on it in 2017, launched it in 2018, and now three years later, um, we've got nearly 300 signatories to that. Um, in terms of um, you know, a lot of the discussions this week, I'm happy to answer any questions about the COP as well, but um, it's still, in a lot of conversations we've had this week, it is, still blows my mind a bit that three years in, globally, we've only got 300 sports organisations signed up to this, when you think of how many sports organisations are out there. So loads of work to be, you know, great steps forward already, a lot of big sports organisations signed up there, um, but still a drop in the bucket, really, compared to how many sports organisations are out there. In terms of the framework, specifically, Ollie, and your question around sort of elite, uh, federations, governing bodies, clubs, leagues versus more grassroots organisations. It is more of the elite level sports organisations that have signed up for this. Um, but we do are at pains all the time to say that it, the whole point of the framework and how it's been set up is that any sports organisation that can that organises sport in whatever means and has the capacity to reduce impact and drive communications, educational advocacy can sign up to the sports for climate action framework and actually when we look at although it's the majority of organizations are at an elite level who've signed up there is a great number of grassroots clubs on there as well organizations etc and actually even um the the sort of initial signatories the law the, that were signed up at the launch you know we had a lot of grassroots sort of college sport organizations signed up in Japan, for example, or, you know, in, in the US, we have a lot of um, colleges signed up who have big college athletics programs, etc. So there is, it's open to all, I would say where it is right now, it's probably slightly easier at a high level to engage those bigger sporting organizations at a professional level in terms of getting to them, helping support them and driving that action. But um, it's open to all and, you know, a grassroots level, we want more of those organizations to be involved. And we see in the UK tennis and cricket organizations where maybe they have one tennis court or one cricket pitch and they've signed up and that's brilliant because we need this top down and bottom up action in terms of the role that sport has to play. Um, then in terms of, I guess, um, the COP, so uh, it, it's been amazing to see the sport activations around the COP. I was just looking at there's 20 side events focused on sport at the COP um, in 2018, at COP24 in Katowice, when we launched it, that was really the first full side event that the COP focused on sport. We've obviously always had perhaps athletes or other organizations engaged at a political or strategic level across some of the, the the events at the COP but that event as far as we know in 2018 was kind of the first one at the COP then in Madrid um at COP 25 there was a few smaller panels etc but this year there's 20 events and what's really exciting about they're in the blue zone the negotiation area the kind of seat of power at the COP if you like and um, in terms of having ministerial engagement and having that connection that perhaps previously has been missing the links with government um, and I would say, you know, those events, either in the green zone or the blue zone inside the COP negotiations or places like the New York Times Climate Hub. Again, it's more professional, it's more um, leagues, clubs, governing, etc. that are engaging there, but also at the sort of the fringe of the COP, if you like, where the COP is the huge circus where you have the big stuff happening inside under the tent of the cop but then obviously so many people convene in glasgow to do side events in hotels and pubs and bars you know on ferries uh, because of the the collective um number of people who are there those sort of side events at the cop we're seeing more engagement at a grassroots level from ngos from advocacy groups from charities etc so i think in terms of the sort of balance i would say that that level the cop and then in the COP itself, it perhaps more is at a professional level or through sort of elite athletes, etc. But again, I think that's transitioned even in the last few years. And I think as things continue to progress and the power of sport um, is leveraged to drive this action, I think we'll see more of 
you know, the stakeholders around sport getting involved. And actually, really excitingly, yesterday I was on a panel with broadcasters around sport and kind of what they're doing, both in terms of reducing their own operational impact and also using their platforms in, in to a sports audience to, to educate and communicate around these big issues. Can I, can I ask then, mm. and we saw on, on Wednesday a really positive announcement that the Sport for Climate Action uh, grouping sport had had signed up to the race race to zero so yeah. reaching net zero by by 2040 and and reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 50 percent by by 2030 mm -hmm. a lot of the the networks organizations that are on the call this afternoon mm -hmm. they're working community level might be in open and green spaces might mm -hmm. uh, be working really at uh, regular community programming translating that commitment and the key actions that's underneath those commitments for those community actors. Mm. What would you say for community sport for development, community sport, what are the two to three key measures that can be taken within their program, within their uh, methodology, within their strategy to really up the contribution to combating climate change? Yeah, so it's a great question, Ollie. I think operationally, I don't think I'm going to blow your minds with the stuff operationally that you can help drive on that. You know, I think based on the reach that you've got and the influence you have operationally, things like, you know, uh, connecting with venues that you use and asking them, you know, around reducing single use plastic if they if their venues are powered by um, renewable energy, for example, trying to encourage people to carpool or use active travel to, to, you know, to travel to games or meets or, or training, etc. So I think operationally, I think this audience and, and all of you here on the call, I think are probably across the ways, you know, that you can make those changes and, and drive that influence to the perhaps the venues or the areas that you work and the way you operate. But I did, I had ahead of the call kind of had to think about from the perspective of more broadly collaboration has been mentioned a lot on this call already this morning and and kind of thinking about from your organization where maybe you're all thinking you know our main focus isn't actually climate change it isn't actually the environment it's this other massive societal issue that you're already tackling so i kind of tried to have a think about um from your perspective how you can bring environmental climate into that work perhaps and even to be honest like you know on the time you organizing this call and talking about it already it will probably be on your your agenda a little bit more like this kind of education and the communication and the advocacy piece is massive so in terms of you know when you connect with your um the people who are taking part in your programs etc even just talk to them incorporating the environment or climate as part of you know, training and education programs that you do, connecting the dots a little bit for people um, in terms of if it's perhaps you're working in trying to get people more active in the community or accessibility, etc. that all of these are going to be made slightly more difficult as the climate crisis worsens. So if we're trying to encourage people to be more active and healthy and, and you know, encourage that lifestyle as we see the rise of these super hot days that we're experiencing you know flooding um, th these extreme weather events that we're having to tackle often the wider sport and development work that you're all doing will be made slightly more difficult by this so again connecting the dots for people that um climate change isn't far away it's happening now and it's with us and actually we're seeing the impact already on sport um, at an elite level yes in terms of performance and, and, and events but also at a grassroots level and at a leisure level in terms of you know kids sport local football fields they're flooded then we can't do our training so what's our backup if we're trying to encourage people to get out and walk more well if it's 37 degrees in the UK and you know in July it's difficult from a health perspective to encourage that same with air pollution you know we're trying to encourage positive behaviors perhaps but if we know air pollution levels are very high then then that becomes an impact as well so that bringing these ideas in to communication and education and advocacy is massive the collaborations massive again national trust and others have been mentioned on this call is there ways that programs can be connected with other environmental programs who maybe do this work already it could be the national trust or wwf or friends of the you know that, that have this and, and can maybe help provide you with the information connect with your programs instead of you having to think oh it's another thing for us to do now is there those collaboration opportunities to leverage what's already out there and then the last couple really quickly that i'll just finish off with are um 
a friend of mine, Laura McCallum, who's the managing director at Protect Our Winters UK, they are doing a lot of programs around how we can use the power of all of our roles in sport, not to work in a silo on our own campaigns, but actually use that to connect with bigger campaigns that are happening, like divestment. So, you know, all our money that's either being invested or put into pensions that's actually funding fossil fuels. Can we be more aware of that? And can we, again, through our own communities, through our own workforces, et cetera, encourage people to use ethical banks? you have have our pensions in something that is more sustainable etc so the connection with our work and bigger programs and then lastly being discerning about organizations we work with so at a professional level in sport we're now seeing a lot of organizations come under fire in terms of sport washing and green washing sport organizations with brilliant environmental programs being lambasted because they're funded by oil organizations, aviation, et cetera, car manufacturers. So again, from your level internally, even just asking the question, you know, funding or collaborations with organizations, who is this organization? Do their values align with ours? Are they doing the right thing in terms of us to avoid those issues and also move the needle a little bit on that? So sorry, Ollie, that was a bit of a brain dump, but I just wanted to throw in all these different ways that I think maybe sport and development can, without making it a huge another thing that you have to think about maybe the way you can just sort of incorporate that with your current programming no, very, very useful i think that point you make around supply chains and the collective opportunity to influence supply chains is important and there's some learning there from the work that this uh, sector network's been involved with around uh, sporting human rights for example but you made a point on connecting the dots mm. connect the dots to priority areas and, and i might at this point so i see you i might bring david in david jen from active Humber, then Zoe, I'll come back to you for a question. It might be relevant uh, or comment for both, for both of them. But David, uh, interested in active partnerships perspective because just see the primary focus there is addressing health inequalities, and particularly health inequalities around physical activity or physical inactivity. And on the back of Claire's point around connecting the dots, I'd be very interested in your perspective insight on that connectivity between that focus that's a strong emphasis across our sector across our networks and the issue around uh, climate change just before you come in please if you've got some questions for Claire please do also use the um the chat box and then David I'll get your thoughts and then Zoe I saw your hand up and I'll come back to you because David and Zoe uh, David and Claire might be able to reflect on your your comments but David over to you uh well, thank you, uh, uh, Ollie. I, I think there's two things really for me here is that climate change is ultimately about inequalities. And that is true everywhere in the world, bar none. And those facing the greatest inequalities are those who are creating the least carbon, the least effect to the environment, but yet they are going to suffer the greatest results. And one of those key ways is going to be around their personal uh, health and whether that be through air quality the effects of flooding etc but i think the bit that i want to make a point about where i think we in community sport can best uh, focus and this is around the sedentary lifestyles because sedentary lifestyles are incredibly carbon intensive through the use of motorized transport the high levels of behaviors relying on sitting in front of a flat screen tv uh, playing games associated uh, with that diets and life and being indoors for long periods of time and all the energy that's used in uh, that and uh, some of the research i've been doing is that that when you add that all up together that's greater than the world's airline industry so this is sedentary behavior and that will take up as much as 20 percent of the world's electricity by 2020 just by us sitting on our backsides and what would be a much better way to do that is get out there be uh, physically active and certainly there's loads of research from who and the different uh, government agencies uh, uh, world government agencies, about uh, if we could get more physically active whether that be through walking or cycling that will have at a world level a massive uh, reduction in terms of the amount of carbon that we're producing and when you listen to people like the uk health security agency and they're talking about extreme heat and extreme uh, um, cold the biggest disease that's going to come out of that is respiratory disease and what they're saying is what's the best way you can protect yourself about that because obviously it's going to happen is be physically active and that's where I think community sport has this great thing 
because it's about your lung capacity and your capability uh, uh, to do that. So I think we've got this very key role to play about our importance, about being active and how that does genuinely help the environment. Now, quite clearly, there are some negative effects to that. But I also think that what we've got in community sport, whether that be recognising our playing fields, our green spaces, our wonderful countryside, our coasts, etc., is that actually being active, it, it values those places. And there's, again, lots of research come out recently that your life will be shortened if you don't have access to green spaces, whether that be playing fields, woods, etc. So again, I think we in community sport got this great campaign to argue in us being active and us playing our sport and doing our stuff at a local community level, we can get these uh, uh, double uh, benefits into it. And the way I sum this up is in this simple argument of be active. So the BE as in B stands for better earth. And the active is I think there's six things we can do in community sport. So the first is we've got to acknowledge and understand it. And one of the things I think we're very weak at the moment in the community sports sector is this. Elite sport is taking all of the headlines and they, it's dead easy to work out the carbon footprint of a stadium it's now an impossible to work out what our effect of community sport is at the moment. So we need to understand that uh, uh, better. We have got to get our house in order, and that's the C, to, uh, uh, challenge ourselves to be better on that. There's loads of things we can do with that. I think the T is to tackle it, and it's what I think is this double whammy of, we are ideally placed to deal with issues of inequalities and health through, climate, uh, uh, through community sport to take it forward. It does come back to inequalities, and uh, I could go on about some of the challenges we've got here in the Humber. I also think it's about making it visible, and we are invisible in the sports sector at the moment. And the slightest challenge, we tried to sign up to the United uh, Nations uh, Climate, and we were told we couldn't join because we were a community uh, group. And that was last year. And then we tried joining Camp here, and we couldn't join that in either. So there's a bit of campaigning on here about us our role in those things because we're not being accepted in in the way that others are in the sport agenda but the final bit is and i think this is the enthusiasm is community sports incredibly inclusive engaging and fun let's tell a story a fun and enjoyment about climate change rather than all of the pessimistic stories that we're having at the moment i think we can tell a much greater story about if you're being active and whether that's walking or cycling, being in the open spaces, what a positive way to make our contribute to climate change. And the great thing is we can do it now by just walking out our doors and starting doing it. So for me, yeah, it's very much about the sedentary behaviours and we almost taking that ground about what we could contribute in a very clear climate change way. Ollie. Uh, thank you, David. And actually your, your be active sort of framework around understanding impact, the sort of the education, promotion, positivity, a lot of crossovers with those principles in the, the sport for climate action framework so i think there is some some work to be done there on that linkage of community sport into those those global global efforts but thanks for that insight and also your leadership on this issue across the sector which has got goes well beyond the the sort of um specific work you're doing within active partnership so thank you for that zoe did you want to come in now just let me introduce yourself we've had a question or a comment uh, and then um um, be great to, 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 to bring you in at this point. Okay, thanks, Ali. Um, my name is Zoe Hopkins. I'm from Homeless World Cup Foundation that's based in Edinburgh, although now I'm in Glasgow for the, for the COP26. Um, so great uh, to hear Claire's comments about, um, you know, joining uh, 300 that you've got at the moment that signed the, the are you calling it the framework or the charter? Um, so yeah we've got we work with 70 different organizations around the world very grassroots football uh, associations that use that use football for development with marginalized people um so that can be in parts of africa or latin america from very impoverished areas that don't get a chance for mainstream you know elite football and um in europe it's with uh, homeless people or you know Sort of ex-prisoners etc so, so pretty much the the people that um, a lot of general mainstream sports programs will forget um, so that could certainly be a, an angle that we can take to to encourage them to sign this this charter um, you know a good chunk of those would probably be interested in it but related to that then is 
you know, how whether or not this coalition um, and all of the different uh, connections, hopefully globally, if there are some out there, I noticed somebody earlier on the call was working in South Africa. Um, so if we can connect um, our grassroots sports people with, a bit like you said, Claire, the, the people that are already specialized in environmental and climate change um, adaptation, they could go along and, and you know give that awareness session and then they can weave into the football curriculum you know these issues that are about protecting the environment and I'd, they'd be very welcome to do that um because you know a lot of them they're using football as um you know the on and off the pitch to to raise awareness in lots of different issues you know in in kenya for example we do a lot of hiv aids awareness with the youth there um and in other areas we're trying to um push social enterprises that are related to environmental protection um you know alternatives to either energy or you know just very grassroots stuff like making masks you know a business rather than buying disposable masks so things things like that that are all can be interrelated to to getting you know the players that come to the football um sessions outside of the football what else can we support them with and i think that um could be strongly related to, to climate justice and the change so yeah, I'd be interested uh, to hear more about the, the if there's any link that you can send me about the 20 sessions that you mentioned that are going on in COP at the moment as well, that would be yeah. great. I'll, um, I'll pop that in the chat as well. I've literally just been updating it this morning because the ones that have taken place, I've been collating the um, sort of watch back links so that everyone mm -hmm. can just easily click into those sessions and rewatch. But yeah, really, impo really important points. And I think in terms of um, uh, just in terms of the join in the framework, because I know, David, you mentioned that as well in terms of, um, you, you know, your inability to join. And I think it's a really important point. And I think just to give a bit of context on that and um, the framework is was kind of set up for sport control making genuine change and almost not organizations that while you have of course the you don't have that control over reducing impacts in a substantive way by having you know as men, as ollie mentioned call perhaps don't have their own stadiums or venues or they don't have that ability to affect that redu reduction of climate um so that's where, where the framework started off that have got that direct control to reduce impacts as well as connect with fans and also then in the past 12 months it's about adding rigor to that so when the framework first started it was about um tracking and reducing um your emissions and that was enough the past 12 months the secretariat has been working very hard with organizations to get what these targets that are now in place to make sure that those signed up are held to account in terms of they can't just make the announcements and then forget about it so a lot of time has been spent on these mechanism to make sure that it is substantive and that it makes sense and then now there's been a lot of discussions about how we can bring in organizations that perhaps don't fall into that rights holder sort of category to drive that but that have got massive um reach and have got a massive ability to influence this in a broader level and that will be the next um, thing that we'll tackle and it you know it does it makes me sad to feel as though it, it hasn't felt like an inclusive experience because obviously the whole point of the framework really was to bring global sport together to tackle this challenge but i think we're on this journey and with, with you know not so much resource within the secretariat as well problems in in climate and sustainability of a lack of resource and funding etc and um, so i can only apologize for that in terms of that you know feeling like you want to join this and, and not being able to but i do think this you know we've been talking about friends of the framework or or even if organizations don't have that direct impact how they can still join and be part of this and help drive that change so i really hope that will follow soon and um, and then hopefully the, the likes of the community that are here will be able to join that and drive that change so I just wanted to make that point on that because I think that's a really important one to, to be clear on. Um, and then Zoe, to your point in terms of connecting with other organisations and collaborating, I think that is is just massive in terms of the power of sport in these areas. And um, I was chatting to who I'm sure you know, David Duke, last yeah, week. Really, yeah, yeah. Um, and we, I, you know, I was on a session with him and we were talking about this. They obviously work with homeless people and engage them to be, you know, to bring them into the community through football as well. Mm -hmm. I don't, which I think, you know, just underlines what we're talking about here, that um, in terms of the power of sport, as go, they, they were doing a session on type two diabetes awareness. 
and, and some nurses come and join that and they had a couple of people join one evening and the next day they brought a Scottish footballer and the room was packed 500 people who came <laughs> to see the footballer but actually they learned about you know the impact of type 2 diabetes and, and what we have to learn about that so mm. again just to put your your efforts and especially as we connect them with climate and the environment the reach people who perhaps otherwise wouldn't engage on on, okay. on that on that point and building on Zoe your points and, and, and Claire your points there I might ask if um Andy and and Sarah from Access Sport will, will come in because a very good applied uh, e e example of working at place at community level on seeking and supporting to to uh, assist communities that are facing disadvantage to actually through not just being more active but ensuring there is availability to open and green spaces be able to contribute positively to some of the issues that that David uh, raised uh, around the challenges and 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 contribution of sedentary lifestyle towards broader climate issues so um Andy, Sarah, can I bring you in now? I must start with you, Andy, just on this interplay, and, and David sort of touched on it, I think Zoe touched on it, on the inequality and in, inequitable impact of climate, but equally the inequalities in terms of access and what might be some positive responses to climate change. Andy. Yeah, th th thanks, Ollie. Yeah, I mean, listening to David's sort of stats about um, the, the impact on on the climate from sedentary behaviour and and the inequalities associated with that absolutely fascinating. Uh, we normally spend most of our time framing our our inclusion work um, in terms of sort of social Im impact rather than climate impact. So just being invited to sort of speak today is kind of given a different lens um, to, to what we do, which is which is fascinating. Uh, and all of our work um, is is focused on tackling inequalities, trying to remove the barriers for disadvantaged and disabled people. Um, which, which is absolutely crucial if community sport is going to make a significant step towards um, net zero. Um, and I guess for us, do, doing community sport in a climate friendly way means local offers uh, that don't require cars to drive to, um, that make sport and physical activity exciting to people who, who live sedentary lives at the moment, not just the people who are already active and involved in, in sport. And ideally, more, much more of this should be focused and targeted in, in the areas of high deprivation with really diverse populations where the stats sort of bear out that you know, they are least active at the moment. And some of the stats are that you know, we work with, with cycling and despite all the chat of a, a boom over, over the last decade, there's, it, the stats are still stark. 78% of disabled people never cycle, 76% of women don't cycle, 75% of, of people at risk of deprivation don't cycle, and only 3% of school children um, cycle to school. Um, and these these inequalities and our sort of collective carbon footprint are exacerbated when we build multi-million pound destination facilities uh, that require cars to get there. Um, and then often the, the sort of cost model requires high session fees and, and further sort of exclude um, who, who can access them. Um, and I guess to sort of bring that into sharp focus, we develop pump tracks, um, mostly in really deprived uh, diverse areas uh, and you know compared to a seven million pound um, destination venue we could build 35 simple free to use uh, community run facilities like pump, like the pump track in, in Bexley that are within walking distance of, of the people that are trying to serve um, and at that point it's probably a good good moment to bring Sarah in who does a lot of work sort of on on the ground um, making sure that these these facilities are sort of accessed by people who aren't already um, cycling or aren't already active. Yeah, thanks, Andy, and thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, so at a local level, delivering in a more climate friendly way means um, empowering communities to take ownership of activity at their local site through volunteering opportunities, creating volunteering opportunities, um, targeted delivery to those who don't cycle, and providing access to equipment. So we equip the sites that we um, that we build um, and. I've got a story here about um, recently, um, so we've just opened Bexley. Bexley was built at the beginning of the year and we were able to start using the site when, um, you know, the gates were open for sport and activity um, facilities to be able to, to be used following the, the last lockdown. 
Um, but one somebody that came to one of our sessions was a lady called Debbie. So Debbie is a Black Caribbean um, lady who ha is a lone parent of three children. And she brought her children down to a session. She was totally focused on the children and it was all about them. But one of her sons mentioned to me that her mum, you know, that, De that Debbie couldn't ride. So we got her riding as well, which was really great. What attracted her to the, the session was that they don't have their own bikes. Um, it was in walk walking distance from their home. Um, and she was really aware of the level of um, the collect the whole families in activity levels. They were, you know, they were lots of sitting around and, and not getting active. And, and at the time as well, you know, they were going through a change. She was recently um, became a lone parent and the pressures that that had put on her sort of financially, but also just emotionally and mentally. And to get out as a family was a really good thing. She is now one of our volunteers, which is really awesome. She is building her skills as well as helping out at sessions. And we are training her up to become a cycling instructor. Um, she's just really infused and just really wants to sort of help. Um, yeah, so, and she wants to actively travel. I think that's a really big thing and she wants her children to as well. So yeah, that's, that's, um, it's about Debbie. So thank you. Sarah, there's a, a, an interesting uh, issue we often talk about when we're looking at policy in this regard. There's no doubt, um, having, and, and David covered it very well, so having people move in the communities in which they, they live and work will contribute and does contribute, whether it be active travel or, or helping address sedentary lifestyle. And we often talk about the, 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 the field of dreams policy. And if you remember, I'm showing my age here. Fantastic Kevin Costner movie yeah. in the early 2000s. And the, the, the headline was, if you build it, they will come. Yes. And often there's an issue within this space where if you build a cycle lane, if you build a space, they will come. But clearly there's, there's social, there's cultural, there's capacity issues that, that are barriers. And in, in the communities of which Access Sport works and where you've said, very cost efficient sort of space or building of, of space for, for cycling in this case. What's your sense on the balance between those barriers of is it the infrastructure, is it social cultural, is it capacity issues? And how do you balance in the program the investment in infrastructure vis-a-vis -vis workforce, an issue we addressed earlier, vis-a-vis -vis sort of program design, program delivery? What, what's the right balance in your sort of experience working in place in communities? So what I would say is one of the, the reasons that I really love working for Access Sport is that we are experimenting. So we are constantly refining, re, re, revising and reviewing the way that we do things. And one of the things that we've recently become so really, really aware of is like the longer term sustainability of, of a, a site that we've activated because my activation process is around a year, um, like intensely and then sort of step back. I mean, luckily at Bexley, you know, like I said, it's just opened. We've managed to recruit over time, um, eight voluntary helpers. We're training them up and then they'll be, you know, off and away doing their thing. But we are also aware that it can't rely, that the sustainability of the site can't just rely on, this, on the, um, the voluntary helpers of the club, but also bringing in the wider community. So sort of gets coming back to that you know collaboration and partnership but partnering with the local council in a stronger way than just building the site and stepping back and then step, them stepping back so with their road safety team and um, also other organizations so other groups um other you know other providers of of services including youth services as well um and yeah so i, I think like you're saying getting that balance right um is something that we're kind of constantly working on, but probably an even balance across the board. I think each part, each component is really important. And also, you know, like we have noticed, like, you know, like you say with the field of dreams, that actually if we, if, I mean, the sites are exciting. I mean, people know about them. Word does spread quite quickly. I mean, Bexley, we have people counters on the, the, the door and it's just like they're really so much activity. It's, un, it's unreal. Um, but we are actively promoting. We are bringing people down there. And I think the biggest thing and one of the things that as a, as a coach was just a bit of a, like, a wow moment was that with the site of Bexley, because of the way it's designed, um, we have been encouraging those who um, use... Um, wheeled vehicles to kind of to, 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 to travel, meaning wheelchair users, trike users. 
and we had a young boy who came to lots of our sessions and as we have as we're um, progressing from we've stopped running our sessions and the volunteers are getting trained up and then they will start running the sessions you know on a sort of sustainability level there's a little gap um and so I kind of explained that to, to his mum and to him and they were like that's fine we know how to use the site now we'll just come down by ourselves and we were, and that's that's what we're about we want to empower yoga, local people to use the site and get the skills because they are technical sites they are very exciting and i'd recommend everyone goes down to them <laughs> we might see a few of us on the call down there uh, but when you say about innovation you said about experimenting vince i'm really pleased you joined us from south africa and i'm thrilled uh, really interested in the methodology you spoke to around really integrating educational games into into the pro into the the, the, the programming that you do. It'd be great if you could just give us some insight into that and some learning from how you've gone about that process, but also what some of the outcomes have been of integrating um, games, awareness raising around environment, around climate, around biodiversity loss. Uh, if you're still, I think Vince is still with us. It was a while ago. You put the message in. Really be thrilled if you'd, you'd come in there. And please, other reflections or any questions for for anyone who's spoken thus far, please raise the hand. But Vince, can I hand over to to, to you? Yes. No. Thanks. Thanks for, uh, for bringing. Me. Yeah. I mean, we I operate um, around the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Park in Southern Africa. So that's made up between South Africa, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe, and you know, I originally started the project there to sort of look at the conflict that existed between the park authorities and the community, um, because the the community, you know, the fences are put up, but they're not they're not put up to keep the animals uh, in; they're put up to keep the community out. And so there's always this conflict. And so using we we developed um, we brought some football tournaments together between the local communities, law enforcement, and um, the various park authorities. And then I kind of struggled because that was quite expensive and the cost to do that was, was quite high. And I was you know, debating you know, what would be more effective in, in trying to alleviate some of the issues around you know, the conflict there and decided to sort of go into a school strategy instead and start working within the, um, the primary school sector. So we'd have a, a broader reach. We could start off educating at a lower level because you, you need to build up the steps. You know, you can come in at the top level with, with uh, community members, secondary school kids. Um, a lot of them have forgotten how to learn or have never learned how to learn. And so we started doing that with the kids. A lot of the games that we play, because our kids, you know, they, they live within 500 metres to two kilometres or 20 kilometres, sorry, of the Kruger National Park, for example, and they've never been inside it. Um, or, you know, 90% of our kids have eaten elephant and buffalo, which is perfectly normal, it's perfectly fine, but they've never seen these animals in their natural habitat. And the park authority is always telling them that they have to protect them. And it's, you know, one of the kids sort of said to me, you know, if we, why does the park spend all the money on protecting rhinos? What about us? Um, so those sort of, you know, questions that, that pop into your head. So we just started looking at, you know, how can we, um, integrate our games. We, we work with, um, we were fortunate to get with uh, coaches across continents who helped us develop a lot of our games. Um, you know, and they came over for a three year training program and helped develop our local coaches and building up the capacity of our local staff. Um, and so we just have discussions. I mean, we're, we're more of a, uh, a plus sport organization. Uh, we try and focus on um, general education. But then just trying to develop conversations around traditional beliefs, which is you know a little bit tough. Um, we've got you know huge poaching problems, um, but trying to see it from the kids' point of views and not necessarily the environment's point of view. That makes sense. Kids are going to have to live in this this this, this area for a long time, you know, and they're the ones who are going to be growing up within it. So their voices have to be listened to and sort of try and weave and nudge them into thinking you know not to think but to yeah to, to try and just introduce those kind of critical um yeah. thinking kind of skills within them as they grow up because this is the program that we want to bring into the secondary schools as well and now we've written the grant um where we're trying to partner with a local university the university of Bender, um and they're sort of going to help us on the on the research side of things with their um, environmental science management 
because it's just trying to find out what do the kids know? Where are the knowledge gaps? How can we bring in the Kruger National Park? How can we bring in other actors within the area? Because uh, the park are under-resourced, but everyone's always looking to the park to provide. So we yeah. need to look the other way and we need to try and draw in those ones. So it's, it takes time um, and it is challenging. Uh, when we talk about climate change, talk about floods and droughts, we're going through all of that at the moment. And these kids are living, living within it. And it's quite interesting, just sorry, one last point is, I mean, a lot of the talk in the UK might be around sedentary lifestyles and health and wellness. But on the South African side of things, especially in the rural areas, where you have kids who are walking three kilometers to school, they're pushing a wheelbarrow with 25 to 50 kilos of water, anything from 500 meters to two kilometers home, or they're chopping firewood, they're farming. So their health and wellness, they're already quite strong and quite healthy, they're you know, very outdoor lifestyle, but it's more in the educational side of things and protecting and understanding the environment that they, they, live, in their, uh, they live in. Thank you. No, thanks. Uh, a really, really interesting and, and insightful example and definitely draw and learn from. I'd encourage everyone to take eight, nine minutes of your time over the next few days to listen to Mia Motley's speech at COP, the Prime Minister of Barbados. has made a point. If the pandemic's taught us anything, the global challenges that we're facing and climate change being key amongst these cannot be solved within national silos and the importance of the interconnect. And we know who's bearing the brunt of climate issues. Barbados, Samoa, Maldives, Kiribati will not exist if we do not make the, the, the changes. That interlink and that learning is absolutely critical. But Vince, you made another important point around the premise of, of sport and physical activity based programming being a valuable space for education. And I noticed I'm sure it was volunteering. Uh, Ali Oliver, CEO of YST, just shared around some plans uh, they have um, and in the school sport and PE space around really strength that integration of climate and environment education within the PE and school sport of offer. Uh, I'm going to see if I can put Ali on the spot to come in and just, just reflect on that. Then I see Mark, and then we've got a closing Mentimeter for, for, for everyone. So that's an ambitious last four minutes, but let's see if we can do it. <laughs> Ali, do you mind just, just sharing your, your reflections there on the educational potential of school sport, PE, community sport in this space? Yeah, th thanks, Ollie. I'll keep it quick because of your four, your four minute timeline, but just to say <laughs> thanks for a great session. I've thoroughly enjoyed listening and learning through it all. So th thank you very much. Um, no, just to say, uh, like, like everybody, we're, we're all kind of, obsessed with how um, contemporary issues like climate change and the environment can be something we contribute to and can add value again to the power of sport in social uh, outcomes and social change. So we've been looking more and more and actually a lot of our youth sport leadership work is telling us that this, this generation have got a voice and they want to use it and they want to find purpose in things they do. So it's been in our thinking for a little while. Um, very interested what I sh shared in the chat was just to you know, coming from Nadine Sahawi, Secretary of State in, in Education around a new Duke of Edinburgh style award. Um, and it absolutely, you know, for us, we'll have to have to uh, get, create an opportunity for physical education and school sport to, to contribute to that. And, you know, very the first thing that we had in mind to do, but now we will align is the school games program, 21,000 schools in it, two and a half million kids. Uh, oh, man, all one. opportunities for children every year has got a values yeah, um, program attached to it so we'll be adding sustainability to the values in the school games just as a very quick and simple um first step towards that i hope that's helpful ollie but thanks for inviting yeah. me to no very much so and an interesting that linkage to the same thought process that, that vince has had in, in his program in, in a very different uh, different context. I thought there was an interesting interlink there. I'm going to ask Kelly now just to share the final Mentimeter and then I'm going to come to Mark. But we've spoken a lot today around the critical importance and value of collective action. And so the last Mentimeter is really to get a sense from the network, from the coalition, what elements of collective action you feel be most valuable um, in taking forward and enhancing the contribution of sport for development to combating climate change. I think we've heard today that there is 
certainly a, a contribution. So perhaps Kelly, take this the, the, the slide down, and, and we'll put the link in the um, in the chat the, the chat box, and then we'll come back to the slide right at the end. Mark, while people are, are, are just quickly touching on that Mentimeter, can I just hand over to you for I guess sort of almost closing reflections? It looks like. Well, um, that Mentimeter question uh, was really kind of stole a bit of my thunder, Ollie. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, so no, the question was um, really, it's fantastic that Ollie for, to getting this group together and really good to hear everybody's enthusiasm for it. And really there is a huge amount of potential for the Sport for Development Coalition and the constituent organizations to make an impact in this space um, through campaigning, local awareness and actually getting people you know that sedentary bit about getting people walking and cycling more and there are some fantastic examples already heard from Axis Sport, uh, David uh, at Active Partnerships, the, the local delivery pilots are doing some brilliant work about you know giving people free bikes and behaviour change and it is one of the uh, active environments is one of the big five big issues for Sport England and it is about trying to join up and mobilise a bit more across the, the built environment, the infrastructure build in transport uh, and, and physical activity and, commu and, and community sport and I think for me one of the things is that, that there is uh, there's a will and there's also a potential route over time to money because there is large amounts of money being put into, say, cycling and cycling infrastructure. And we all know that that needs to be balanced with revenue funding. It needs to be balanced with activation funding. And there, there is the opportunity now to get together, to, to advocate and to bring kind of new faces around the table. Um, you know, Ollie, you, you know, we've, we've been talking about linking with people like the Quality of Life Foundation, Sustrans and others, and it is great to see uh, Ali Ali there uh, talking about schools and how that can be link linked up. So, yeah, I, I just hope that we can get that working group together yeah. and uh, keep going. And so today isn't just uh, the end of a conversation. No, definitely it needs to it needs to be the start, and the catalyst for for further action. So, look, Mark, you wrapped wrapped that up really well. Ask if people could. Again, in the chat room on that uh, chat function, you'll see the link to the Mentimeter. Give that direction uh, around what are going to be the most impactful next steps for the coalition, for the network to, to, to really contribute and, and, and play our role as a network, as, as a collective in what is, without exaggerating, the existential issue that uh, we are uh, facing. Uh, I'll hand back to Kelly just to wrap up and, and, and the next steps. Please uh, finish up uh, that Mentimeter. Thanks to Claire, David, Andy, Sarah, Vince, Ali, Mark, Zoe, all of you who, who came in. I know a few of you, Zoe, Claire in particular, have been very busy at COP the last few days. So thanks so much for making the time. Uh, I hand back to Kelly just to, to finish up today's session and just set out next steps after today's town hall. Uh, next town hall will actually be uh, February. So we've got the break over uh, December. Otherwise, it would be the first week of, of January. But uh, Kelly, do you want to wrap up in next steps? Yes, thanks, everyone. Um, following this session, there'll be a recording sent out of the Big Issue discussion. And we'll also use all of your feedback in the chat and on Mintimeter um, to produce kind of some follow up actions and uh, sort of the follow up response collective response and how we're going to take this forward from the Mentimeter it looks like establishing a coalition working group for sport and climate action um, and then sort of last thing I would like to ask you all to do before I let you get on with your day is to give us some feedback on this town hall event and I'm just posting in the chat now uh, a very short survey link for you to fill in to provide sort of your feedback on the town hall um, if there are any inputs that weren't be weren't able to be recorded in the session Sort of during the session you can also add them in here so please do let us know um, what you think and sort of um, any any further inputs but yeah again thanks everybody for joining really fantastic uh, discussion uh, and great to have sort of organizations from the UK and globally because this is such a global issue global issue too so thank you thank you so much everyone and have a great rest of day
and a great weekend. Thanks, Kelly. Cheers, Andy.